I'm going to try and do something new. I'm going to try a little, you know, I know we go through the Bible every day through the week and that's good and necessary and I enjoy doing it. But I want to start a Bible study, like actual going through topics and scriptures and different things. And the main focus behind it was to teach my children about the Lord. When they, learned, when they were little bitty things, I used to haul them all over the place to church with me. And, you know, they learned some things. They pick up more than what you think they do. But uh, they're at that age now where they don't want to go. And being that my own church life's been up in the air for a while, I don't make them. But uh, I will have them know about Jesus because to me it's the most important thing that a parent can pass along to their children. You know, we give them food, we give them shelter, we give them love. That's all wonderful and necessary. But if you can't give them the bedrock upon which a better life, the only real life can be built, then you've not, you've not given them what they need. And, uh, and a lot of you can't because you don't have it yourself. And I understand, I understand how it is, but you know, that can change. It can change tonight. It can change today. If you want salvation, just seek him out, get saved, get your heart right with God, get filled with the Holy Spirit. And then according to this, he inspired every word, says he shall teach you all things. Then you in turn can turn around and teach it to the people you love most in the world. Give them what they need. You know, you can give them a million dollars if you don't show them how to get to Jesus. You've not done your job. And uh, that's, that's just how I feel about that because I know what I've been through and I know what the Lord's brought me through. And my children are going to know about Jesus. We tried this just sitting down at the table, which was what I wanted to do, and going through it live in person. <laughs> Everybody kept getting tickled and laughing. Of course, I got mad and stormed off. But the, in the in the age we live in, I guess this is just going to have to do. You know, you have to take somebody in the next room to get them to talk to you, or you got to live stream something for them to watch you. So I'm going to put this up probably on YouTube or something, force them to watch it and learn about the Lord. Can't force you to watch it, but I hope you will come along because, you know, if I consider this important enough to give to my own kids, I certainly think it's, it's important for you too. And I hope you will uh, take it in. And uh, and I guess to start with, if I, when I think about the Word of God, you know, when I used to try and read it as a sinner, I'd always start at the beginning because, you know, that just made sense to me. And I knew about Jesus. I believed in Jesus, but you know, I never could see him in these first several books. Uh, all I ever saw was some stuff I'd seen in movies. And uh, once I get out of that and start seeing some of this stuff, I'd just get bored. But now that I've been indwelt with the Spirit of Christ, I can look through here and see Jesus everywhere I look, pretty much. And it's awesome. And you just keep seeing more of him. The more you read it, the more layers get peeled off, the more you see. And it's just, it really is the living word. I know it's a written word, but it is alive because it is about the, the living word, Jesus. And, uh, and so to me, the starting place has to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And what do most people think about when they think about the beginning of Jesus? They think about him as the little, you know, the Christmas story, baby Jesus in the manger in Bethlehem. And we'll get to that. That's a good place to start. But we know what Jesus gave up. For us in this world, he gave up his own body, his own blood he shed for the remission of sin. He gave up his body, beat, slapped to death, unrecognizable, so that our bodies could be healed. He gave all that up. And I never will diminish that, but until you really know what he gave up before that, you can never really still appreciate what he did give up for you and me because he existed before he ever showed up in Bethlehem. Somewhere in here he talks about, uh, he's, he's praying to his father and he says, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world was. See, he left his, that song, he left his home in glory and came down and died for you and me. He gave up all that. And we're going to get to it. I've got, I, you know, a dozen scripture verses written down. We're going to try and get to all that. But you see what he left to come down here. And not just, you know, he lived among us and lived a perfect life and then ultimately died for us and rose again. And he didn't stop there. He's cut, he makes intercession for his children right now and he's coming back for us. I believe that. So let's, uh, I got a few uh, proof scriptures here that uh, Jesus indeed did exist before he ever showed up, you know, 2,000 years ago. 
And here's one of the first ones that we come to. It's the creation story. Uh, you know, if you know anything about the Bible, you know the first little bits about, you know, and on the first day God did this, and on the second day he said this. And here it is on the sixth day. This is when he creates man in his own image. And here's what it says, word for word. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle all over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So what was the big deal about that? You see that it says, God said, let us create man in our image. Who's, who's he talking about? It was Jesus because we're going to find out here in a little bit that uh, Jesus was right there in the beginning. We go to, uh, well, let me, before I go to John, there's another verse here in Genesis that's kind of makes the same point here about the hour. Let me see where it's at. Chapter 11, verse 7. This is in the story of Babel. After the flood and uh, everything started flushing back out and they started being fruitful and multiplying, God told them to subdue the earth, you know, be fruitful, multiply, all that stuff, kind of spread out and subdue the earth. But uh, they got a plan that they didn't want to go out all over the earth. They all wanted to come together as one people, and they started building this big tower that was supposed to reach up into heaven in the land of Babel. And uh, if you work your way down through time, that Babel ends up being Babylon, which is right at the center of the worldly governments every time in here. Babylon and Alexander the Great's capital is Babylon. You see in the book of Revelation, Babylon the Great has fallen, you know, mystery Babylon and all that. Right there's where it got started in the very first, you know, kind of antichrist figure dictator guy was Nimrod, and he was leading the charge to build this thing. But uh, it did not please the Lord. And uh, the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language. So that's when he goes down, and they're all speaking one language, and he does something to them to where they can't understand each other and makes all kinds of different languages, forcing them to spread out and subdue the earth. But out there again, it said, let us go down. It's the Father and the Son and the Spirit. All work the Godhead is what it's referred to in Scripture. So Jesus was right there, and you'll see a famous verse in the John chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word. Who was the Word? It says, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I'm flipping as I go on, because I know that verse pretty good. I've quoted it enough. Uh, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. In the beginning. But, you know, the beginning beginning is a time word. How many of you know that God is not subject to time because time is a creation. Time is a created thing. God made it. And some people get all confused about it. You know, they believe Jesus existed before, but they've got him being some kind of angel or all kinds of stuff. If you don't get Jesus right, that's why we're starting here. If you get Jesus wrong, you're going to get the whole rest of it wrong. It's like starting a foundation. If it's not, you know, I don't know much about building, but I know the foundation's got to be solid and square, you know. If it's not perfectly square and plumb and all that stuff, the higher up you go and the further out you get away from that starting point, the more, the further off it is. So you got to get Jesus right. There's a lot of cults out there that believe Jesus. They, they preach another Jesus. And I'm trying to show you the true Jesus. He's, he's, not, he's not a created being. Yes, it says several times that he is God's only begotten son. In that he's the only son that came forth from the Holy Ghost into a human woman that was begotten that way. And another way, he was the first begotten from the dead. That's how he's the only begotten son but he's also the firstborn of many brethren, giving us the pattern of what's going to happen to us when we go to the grave. We too are going to be begotten back from that grave by that very same spirit. Amen. But it says, you know, the same was in the beginning with God. It says all things were made by him. So if this word, how do we know this word is Jesus? 
I don't, I don't know that his name was Jesus back then. I don't know that he was Jesus till he got named Jesus as a baby, but he was, it's the same, he was the word, he was, you know, it was Jesus is who it was. But down here, if we'll skip a little bit, it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. That's got to be talking about Jesus. So if he's the word, he was in the beginning, and he created everything. It says, without, it says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So he would not, he was not created. He was indeed the creator. All the stuff you see, even back in that first part in Genesis, let there be light, let there be this. That was Jesus doing that. He's the word. The father worked through the word, through Jesus. See, we'll find out that, uh, I don't have the scripture reference, but it says God is a spirit and he seeks such to worship him in spirit and truth. But uh, Jesus, you know, spirit, you can't see him. It says no man has seen God at any time, but I've got it jotted down here. And it says the only begotten has declared him because he is the visible image of the invisible God. And I think that actually is a, a verse I've got written down. But uh, while we're in John, I mentioned that prayer earlier. I know I'm skipping all over the place, but I'm just trying to show you that Jesus has been, he's, you know, when God the Father in here says somewhere that he's the Alpha and Omega in the book of Revelation, it's Jesus saying, I am the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega. He is God. That's what I'm, that's the whole point. A lot of, a lot of religions don't believe that. Some of them say he was a great man, a prophet, this, that, and the other. Some say he was an imposter. Some, a lot of people don't even believe he exists, even though there's, Countless evidence of it. But uh, he's praying. He's praying to, to the Father. And I know that's con that's confusing. How can, you know, if they're all the same, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I can't explain it. I just believe it. And I wish I could offer you something more. But uh, it reminds me of when Jesus and the apostles were going around doing their thing. And I believe it was Philip who hardly said anything. He said, Speaking to Jesus, he says, show us the Father, and it suffices us. And, and he says, have you been with me so long? And don't you know that have you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Because they were one. One in purpose, one in substance. They are one, the Godhead. He, it says that Jesus was the fullness of that Godhead, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus was the fullness of it bodily. And... Uh, well, I've surpassed it. where he's praying. He's praying to the Father. He says, Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Amen. And I'll just hit on a few others because I'm, you know, we're already up to 13 minutes. But again, I'm just trying to show you that what Jesus truly gave up to come down here and... Uh, and do what he did for not just me and you, but everybody who's ever lived or ever will live. It's very amazing. You talk about love, that's love. Let's go to Colossians, if I can find it real quick. Colossians chapter 1, there's a bunch of good preeminent Christ stuff in here. It says, it's talking about Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Amen. It says, speaking of Jesus, who is the image, this is what I just quoted a while ago, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Amen. It says, for by him, were, here's another one, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him. Why? And for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All things hold together by Jesus. That's who he is. And yet he came down here and, and humbled himself. Where's that verse? Let me get that. i got to get to that one. That's a good one. Philippians. Here's what he did. As to leave all that and be born as an infant, you know, helpless, having to be fed, having to be changed. Growing up in a body that can feel pain and be tempted in all the ways that we are and yet do it without sinning. You know, that right there was huge. And that was a miracle in and of itself that he could go through all that and not sin. But 
you know, he didn't have Adam's blood. I guess he had that going for him, though. Something that we didn't. But anyway, I ain't going to diminish art from what Jesus did. Philippians 2, 7. All right, it says, speaking of Jesus, he made of himself no reputation. And if you look all that up, it's a fancy Greek word. It really means that he poured himself out. He emptied himself of all that glory that he just prayed about with the Father, all that stuff he had before, he emptied himself and he came down here to become a human being. And it says, he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. And one of these days, every knee's going to bow of things in the heaven and the earth and beneath the earth. Everything is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. That's who he is. That's who he was. That's who he is. That's who he's always going to be. And uh, I know we're running a little long here, but I'll hit just a few more. You can see things. Uh, like I told you, I couldn't see Jesus in that Old Testament when I tried to read it when I was still lost. Now you can go back and you can just see all over the place uh, instances where it, it was him. You know, his name wasn't Jesus. Sometimes he was referred to as the angel of the Lord. You see that? Let's see. Let's go to Joshua. I was just reading through Joshua the other day. You remember before, I think it was right before they were going to Jericho, you know, the walls of Jericho come down. Somebody shows up to Joshua. And let's see what uh, verse that is. <laughs> and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Are you for us? Or for our adversaries. AJ didn't know who this guy was. He's got his sword pulled out and looks like he's getting ready to <laughs> kick some tail. But uh, he says, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, now I, as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot. For the place where thou standest is holy. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Same thing got said to Moses, and we're going we're gonna to hit that one before I quit too. But notice Joshua falls down and worships. You see that many times through Scripture. Angels get worshipped. People try to worship them, and they say, no, don't worship us. You see people in heaven, that somebody, the writer that got took up to heaven, I guess it was John, and he, he starts talking with this guy, and he falls down and tries to worship him. He says, don't worship me. I'm just a servant. But every time you see in the Gospels when somebody falls down at the feet of Jesus, he never rebukes them. This angel of the Lord never rebuked Joshua. He didn't say, don't worship me, worship God. Why? Because many think that that was the pre-incarnate Christ, as they would call it. Actually, they know the talking heads of theology call that a theophany, an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. There's a few more, and we'll end on some of them. Uh, Genesis 14. This is when... Uh, you ever heard the story of Abraham talking to some angels when they're fixing to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham's, because he's got Lot, his nephews down there, and he's like, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he starts trying to bargain with him, you know, if there's just 45 down there, yeah, or if there's 40, and he keeps going all the way down to 10. I think that's where we're at here. Let me, let me find this real quick. Genesis 14. Uh... No, that's Genesis 18. I'm sorry. I get there. Maybe. Yeah, all right, here we go. I'll read through just a little bit, just to show you here. It says, And the Lord, well, that's pretty self explanatory. The Lord appeared unto him, Abraham, in the plains of Mamre. Remember, God's a spirit. The Lord Father is a spirit. Who's the visible image? Jesus. So if Abraham's talking to him. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Jesus. 
And uh, it says, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent, bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched. Wash your feet, rest yourselves under the tree. And he's going to fix them some food, have Sarah fix them up some grub. But that's just all I want, because that's the part I was talking about when they're trying to bargain over Sodom. But, it, you know, it was the Lord that met with him. Where's the, here's a good one with uh, Jacob. Let's flip over to chapter 32 in Genesis. You've heard this story too, probably. When Jacob wrestles with that angel. Jacob, he was on his way, uh, I guess he's on his way back, but he says, and it, it's weird how this says this. He don't give you no build up, just throws you right in the middle of something. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him. Just out of the blue, he's wrestling with some dude. And it says, wrestled with him until breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, and he was out of joint. And this angel said, let me go for the daybreak. And uh, Jacob said, I will not let you go, except you bless me. And the angel said unto him, uh, now Jacob, it says, and he said unto him, What is thy name? Okay, this is the angel talking to Jacob. Jacob says, Jacob. And he says, Thy name shall be no more called Jacob, but Israel. That's when his name got changed. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, said, Tell me, I pray, what is thy name? And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So he's seen God face to face. That happens with the the parents of uh, Samson. I just read through that too. They ask him the same thing. They're wanting to know his name. He's don't worry about my name, in other words, because they were afraid they were going to die too, because they said they've seen God face to face, kind of that same that same deal. Another one I ain't going to look it up but you remember when daniel's buddies get thrown in that fiery furnace shadrach meshach and abednego and, and the king's looking he's like didn't we put three bound into the fire lo i see a fourth one walking around loose and unharmed and the fourth one looks like the son of god you reckon that could have been jesus i believe it could have and here's a here's one of the most obvious ones it's in gina gina genesis and Hebrews. This guy's only mentioned two or three times. I think he's in the Psalms too, but it's Melchizedek. All right, let's go to Genesis 14. Read real fast. This will be it, I promise. So Abraham, he's went to he's went to fight against all these kings and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and all these other places. And of course, Abraham prevails. And they try to, to give Abraham all kinds of stuff. He's like, no, I ain't going to take your stuff because I ain't going to let nobody say you made me rich. But it says, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after the return of the slaughter and the kings. And it says, and Melchizedek, he just shows up, king of Salem. Salem, which would end up being Jerusalem, I believe. Brought forth bread and wine, bread and wine. This is my body, this is my blood. Don't that sound like that? It says he was a priest of the Most High God. Who's our high priest? Jesus. And he blessed him. He blessed, you know, the less is always blessed of the better. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. He said, blessed be Abram. He's still Abram at that point. Of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And uh, blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. It says, Abraham gave him tithes of all. That's the 10th. That's where all that started. Now, you still hear that in churches today, but, you know, Abraham, he didn't go around doing that every week at church. he just give this one man one-tenth that one time. But when you get to the law, you definitely see the tithe. You know, God institutes that, and I won't get into all that right now because I'm trying to finish. But let's finish up with the other main thing about Melchizedek because it's over in the New Testament. And it's making a comparison with him and the Lord, I believe. It's in the book of Hebrews. I know I'm going all over the place. Chapter 7. Okay, where's that at? 
I'll just read a little bit. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. He's just going back over what we just read. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. King of righteousness, king of peace. Bread, wine, let's see what else it says. It says he's without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. I mean, is that pretty it's pretty obvious, isn't it? I've heard people say they well, they won't commit to that Jesus for some reason. I've heard them have a you know, say it was Shem or somebody. You remember Noah's son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, but I mean, come on, that's got to be Jesus, right? Without beginning of days or end, and without father, the brought forth the wine and all that good stuff. But uh, I hope you can see that Jesus did not just start in Bethlehem. He didn't just come as a baby. That was, that was part of, you know, his humiliation, so to speak. I know the ultimate humiliation was to go to that cross and be whipped and spit on, his beard ripped out and all that, but understand that he was the glorious creator of everything <laughs> and he left all that emptied himself of that and humbled himself to come down here and die and live among us and die for us and rise again and he's coming again praise god that's what i wanted you to know about my lord and we'll we'll continue on i don't know what the next lesson will be about but uh, we'll see you next time god bless